Hi there and welcome back to the Atari portfolio. I thought this week we would talk about the history of the DIP company and the Atari portfolio itself, or how it became the Atari portfolio. There's some uh, technical information and the real world costs of these machines in current dollars. So back in the very early 80s, there was a company in the United Kingdom called Scion. And a lot of you may know that name because Scion built organizers. Uh, the Scion 55C were one of my favorite palm top organizers ever. It's a fantastic design, but I digress. So Scion made computer games for Commodores, Ataris, I think ZX 80s and things like that. And... In the early days, they decided they were going to move into the hardware market, and this was about, I think, 81, 82, and they decided that they were going to build an organizer. And when they came out with their organizer one and organizer two, they had a small dedicated engineering team on it. One of these engineers was a chap by the name of Ian Cullimore. And Ian worked on some operating system stuff, some hardware stuff, serial ports, those sorts of things. And he got a bit of the entrepreneurial bug, as a lot of people in this era did. And so in mid-1986, Ian decides to leave Scion. He believes that the future is in PC compatible. That as nifty as an organizer is in shrinking that much hardware down that a PC-compatible device, a palm-top device, is really going to be the game-changer. And so he forms Crush Proof Limited in mid-86, and he's having a ball, you know, uh, filing out paperwork and getting his company started and getting bank accounts. But he realizes that he needs to have the right people to help him. His strengths lie in an engineer, a software developer, and he needs to have some smart people join his company and so he poaches from Scion or attempts away David Frodsham who was a marketing whiz and Peter Baldwin who was in business development and in late 86 they join the company and they rename it and they call it Distributed Information Processing Limited or DIP you know of course DIP actually stands for David, Ian and Peter but Distributed Information Processing sounds a little better so they end up developing the DIP Pocket PC. And in early 1988, David makes a deal with Atari to release the Pocket PC in the US. In 87, the market bombed. And so all of the funding that they were hoping to get fell apart on them. They managed to get enough of this machine together. They built the... Um, the ASIC that glues all of the logic together, they had the design working, the case was their own design, they prototyped the case themselves, they have a working machine, and they can fund it in the UK probably, but they need some financing to bring it to the US. And so David makes this deal with Atari, and Ian doesn't like the deal, and so there is internal friction, we know this story, and so Ian ends up leaving DIP, and even moves on and he ends up moving to the United States and he creates a company called Pocket, P-O-Q-E-T and Pocket comes up with the Pocket PC, P-O-Q-E-T PC and they ended up getting a whole bunch of funding from Fujitsu and instead of using the 8088 uh, they used the low power 386, the 386SX and the Pocket PC with a Q has 640k RAM, it's got a full-size screen, it's got a full-size keyboard, it runs DOS, it is 100% DOS compatible, and they even invented the PCMCIA slot while they were at it. That's another story, and if I can find a pocket with a cube, I will do a video on that as well, because it is a lovely device as well, but that is the history of this fantastic little device. So, we spoke of the 50 hour run time on 3AA batteries. There was a lot of fiddling about that they went through to try and get this kind of run time on such a power source, something that was easily available 
inexpensive to replace. The unit uses a bunch of tricks. So the first one is the keyboard is only scanned periodically and the less you use it, the less often it scans the keyboard. So instead of scanning it a thousand times a second, it might slow down to only scanning it once or twice a second. It also has an internal timer based on the last time a key was pressed, which will shut down the laptop, or sorry, the palm top, and save some battery. The screen refresh, all of that is handled inside its graphics driver. So you weren't supposed to directly access the graphics driver if uh, the graphics IC. You were supposed to access the BIOS routines for this and that allowed the system to refresh the screen as infrequently as possible because a full screen refresh takes a lot of juice and having played a couple of games on it the screen refresh rate is not great and so like a complete left to right full refresh is not great and uh, as such I imagine it did require a bit of juice. The internal static RAM is powered by the three AA batteries it will last a couple of years if you don't use it. The unit has a couple big capacitors in here and so you can replace the battery without the static RAM discharging so you won't lose data. Uh, I believe you have about three or four minutes of capacitor life before it'll begin to fail so a little bit of time to do those batteries. As I mentioned before these guys have their own coin cell batteries one to two years depending on the size. The 32 and 64 K's were supposed to last two, two and a half years. The 128 K's are supposed to last a year. I've had these go about 18 months before they start to fail. To replace the battery, it has to be inserted into the unit. The unit needs to be powered on. And then you can use a screwdriver to pop the clip out, pull the battery out, new battery in, clip in, done. So that way you don't lose anything. The units came with a, oh, I should mention, this standard here uh, is not, in fact, DIPS. This is called a B-card, and it was particularly popular in Japan in the early days. It was also used quite a lot in um, keyboards, synth keyboards. Uh, so these were used to store MIDI patterns and things like that. The unit has an expansion port built in. I'll try and pop it off. I think it's in and there we go and uh, I saw one of these connectors just the other day and for the life of me I can't remember what it was on but um, it looks fancy and special clearly not the unit came with fresh out of the gate a serial and a parallel box so here you have serial connection to other machines uh, to external modems and here's your printer it also came with a modem box that came straight uh, with the unit that had a pair of couplers attached so you could hook them up to a phone, an acoustic coupler, and also a MIDI card. So there's not much to it, nice and light, and there. The unit is now serial capable. It has a file transfer software built in. It's one of the applications. Menu. Setup. File transfer. Now the built-in system worked from the parallel port. Uh, and I had a bear of a time getting this to work and what I realized was that I was using it on machines that still had parallel ports not too many of those uh, and the software that comes with it is just a dot com so it needed to be a PC and anything Windowsy after I guess 3.11 so 95 and up if you even sniff at LPT1 it decides you want to talk to the printer and it fires up the print spooler which is not convenient so I ended up uh, installing FreeDOS on a CD booting off CD and then using the FT.com 
so I could talk to this. And at one point I started reverse engineering the parallel port communication protocol using my logic analyzer and then discovered that some very clever person had already done that and written a Linux application for it. So, in the future, my problem will be solved. So, when this thing was fresh out in 1988, the Atari unit itself was $399.95 US. So in 2016 money, that's 768 bucks. Now, the laptops of that time were usually around two to three thousand dollars plus, so a fair deal. The serial port was initially released at $79.95, $80, $49.95, $50, so that's $153 and roughly $90 US in today's money. The 32K card was $80, the 64K card was $130, and then the 120k card came in at $200, or $384 US 2016 money. The expansion modules, as I said, the serial port, the parallel port, were not inexpensive, but um, again, when you compare it to putting everything together in a laptop, which you'd have to buy an external modem for and things like that anyway, I think you still came out ahead. Obviously you need to shuttle a lot of data. Having a bunch of cards could make things problematic. You could however purchase a external reader for these that connected to an ISA card. So you could use your PC's hard disk as long-term storage and just swap data on and off these cards. I do not have a price for one of those, but I imagine it probably would have been in the two to three hundred dollar range. Well, this one got a bit dry. Uh, hopefully nobody fell asleep there. I have a bunch of other stuff prepared on completely a different topic, so I will try and get that one out to you the next week or two. If you have been, thank you so very much for watching. Take care of yourselves.